Welcome back to another episode of Power Play, where we travel the world to explore the hard truths of the energy transition. I'm your host, Paul Browning, and today we're traveling to Washington, D.C., and diving into a fascinating comparison of how two global powerhouses, China and the United States, are tackling the energy transition. We'll explore how China's centralized, top-down communist business environment contrasts with the U.S.'s history of decentralized, bottoms-up, capitalist, and democratic processes, which recently have been supplemented with massive subsidies from the federal government. So let's go. I made my first visit to China in 2009 and have visited many times since, witnessing firsthand the dramatic changes that have taken place over the past 15 years. While at GE in the 2010 timeframe, I was leading GE's largest power generation business that was the world's leading provider of clean coal and natural gas power generation technology. The Chinese market was already large and growing rapidly, and we wanted greater access to it. My team and I did two market access partnerships in China. One was to create a coal gasification joint venture with Shenhua Coal, China's largest coal company and a state-owned enterprise. The other was a gas turbine partnership with Harbin Electric, one of China's largest power generation manufacturers and also a state-owned enterprise. Both partners bundled GE's technology, products, and services with their own capabilities to sell complete turnkey solutions to Chinese utilities, which were also state-owned enterprises. I learned a lot during those years about how the Chinese do business. For example, with state-owned enterprises calling the shots, oftentimes the winner of a competitive bidding process was determined more by whose turn it was than by who made the best offer. As long as we were in the right ballpark on price, performance, and terms and conditions, they tended to award orders so that all of the manufacturers achieved an acceptable market share. I also learned that Chinese views on intellectual property were much less strict than in the U.S. For this reason, we were really careful to shield our most valuable IP by manufacturing those products and services outside of China, while being more willing to manufacture our more mature products in-country. So in 2010, for Western manufacturers like GE, our focus was on gaining access to the large and rapidly growing Chinese market with our state-of-the-art technology by partnering with local state-owned Chinese companies. As we discussed in episodes two and three, in the intervening years, Chinese central planners have been deploying five-year plans. And rather than try to compete with GE and other Western manufacturers on gas turbines and other legacy products, Chinese manufacturers have established a dominant position in the high-growth PV solar and lithium-ion battery supply chains and are rapidly becoming leaders in electric vehicle manufacture. They're also the leading provider of alkaline electrolyzer products globally, with a price that's about a quarter of European competitors. Now let's fast forward to the present day and the recently passed Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, which have convinced companies around the world that the U.S. will be a hot growth market for the energy transition. And with recently announced tariffs on Chinese energy transition products, in a remarkable turnaround, it's now the Chinese companies that are trying to figure out how to gain access to the large and growing U.S. market. GE and other Western companies are still the leaders in gas turbine technology, and Toyota, BMW, General Motors, and Ford still lead in internal combustion engine automobiles. But the Chinese are now the energy transition technology leaders, having leading products in solar panels, battery energy storage, electric vehicles, and electrolyzers. With import tariffs plus massive tax credits for U.S. manufacturers acting as trade barriers, these Chinese manufacturers are now seeking to partner with U.S. companies to gain access to the U.S. market. And this is also creating a really interesting dynamic for the few U.S. manufacturers who have managed to hold their own against the Chinese in past years. One great example of this is First Solar, a company headquartered in Arizona that has a thin-film CAD-TEL solar technology that's much lower cost to produce than Chinese silicon products but with somewhat lower cell efficiency. Prior to passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, First Solar was a very strong competitor, but with very thin profit margins that were in the low single digits. And it was expanding its factory capacity in Asia, but not in the U.S. In the first quarter after the IRA took effect, First Solar's profit margins surged, and they've stayed elevated ever since. 
First Solar's products are sold out for several years, and they've announced significant U.S. factory expansions. And another interesting dynamic is that companies from Europe, Japan, Korea, and yes, China, are announcing plans to build or expand factory capacity in the United States to take advantage of IRA subsidies. And here's another really interesting dynamic. U.S. trade barriers are preventing ultra-cheap Chinese solar panels from entering the U.S. market, which creates an interesting dynamic where solar panels in Europe now cost 13 cents a watt, but in the U.S., the same products sell for $0.25 cents a watt. But no one's willing to bet that this situation will continue and provide capital to an American startup company that depends on continued trade barriers for its business model. In addition, the IRA tax credits begin to sunset in 2030. But it takes a few years to get a new factory permitted, financed, and built. And then it takes more time to get a new product accepted by project developers and project financiers. So in some sense, the IRA tax credits are only available for a few years if a startup company hasn't already broken ground on a new manufacturing facility with a proven product. Add on to all of that the uncertainty related to this year's election cycle, where control of the White House, Senate, and House are all up for grabs, with widely divergent views of climate change and energy transition subsidies between the two parties. This is a fascinating time for energy transition in the U.S. and China. Looking to the future, both countries will need to address their respective challenges to achieve a sustainable energy transition. For China, the challenge will be to maintain its rapid pace of development within China while also developing international partnerships to gain market access outside of China in an increasingly protectionist global marketplace. For the U.S., the challenge is to create a more cohesive national strategy that leverages the strengths of its decentralized capitalist system while ensuring that all regions benefit from the energy transition. And if the U.S. blocks low-cost Chinese products for solar, batteries, and EVs, U.S. consumers will be paying much higher prices than the rest of the world for energy and for cars. And as we discussed in Episode 6, an urgent challenge in the U.S. is to streamline the lengthy delays related to permitting, regulation, and local opposition so that the massive bipartisan infrastructure law and IRA subsidies can be rapidly deployed. Well, that's a wrap on episode 13. The energy transition is a complex and multifaceted challenge that requires diverse approaches. China's centralized control allows for rapid deployment and cohesive policies, while the U.S.'s decentralized market-driven system fosters innovation and competition. Both approaches have their strengths and weaknesses, and both countries are changing their approach in an effort to position themselves to win a future dominated by energy transition technologies. Thanks for joining me on this exploration of the energy transitions in China and the U.S. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with others who are passionate about understanding the complexities of our changing world. Until next time, I'm Paul Browning, and this is Power Play.